Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again. In this video, we're going to take a look at the concept of extending the NEC mainline and Acela service from Washington, D.C. to Richmond, Virginia. The NEC mainline is 453 miles long and currently runs from Boston to Washington, D.C. Some regional routes extend south to Richmond, but they have to switch from electric to diesel locomotives since the line is not electrified south of D.C. This takes about 20 minutes at Washington Union Station. Washington, D.C. is a metro of 6.2 million and the seat of the federal government. Bus and Metro Rail Transit at Washington Union Station are provided by the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. Regional Rail to Maryland is provided by Maryland Area Rail Commuter. And Virginia Rail Express does the same for Virginia. Washington, D.C. is serviced by Amtrak via regional and long-distance routes, including a connection to Richmond. Richmond is a metro of 1.3 million, and it is the seat of the Virginia state government. Richmond's Main Street Station has access to bus and bus rapid transit services through the Greater Richmond Transit Company and is also serviced by Amtrak on regional and long distance routes, as well as Amtrak Thruway bus service. The two cities are 97 miles apart as the crow flies. By passenger rail, the trip is currently about 116 miles. Most of the route between is owned by CSX and the Virginia Passenger Rail Authority, with an interesting feature, it's split down the middle. The right-of-way is wide enough for four tracks, CSX gets room for two, VPRA also gets room for two. For this video, we will look at four options. Number one, no build express. Number two, electrify the existing route and separate passenger traffic from freight. Number three, VPRA's longer term aspirations. And number four, electrify and increase speed of the existing route aiming for geometry that would accommodate the top speed of Amtrak's new Alstom Avelia Liberties, 160 miles per hour. Virginia has studied this issue as part of the Southeast High Speed Rail Corridor and has a Tier 2 Environmental Impact Statement, which is part of the basis for their Transforming Rail in Virginia initiative. Between D.C. and Richmond, this would aspire to build the foundation of option number three over a couple of decades. Let's get option number one off the table real quick. As mentioned, you have the pain of having to switch to diesel at Washington Union Station. Beyond that, you're currently looking at a two hour, 40 minute travel time over this 116 miles for a measly 43 miles per hour. This is with five intermediate stops. Eliminate those and you pick up about 20 minutes for a two hour, 20 minute trip and an average of 50 miles per hour. Amtrak will be introducing dual mode locomotives in the next few years that could run on either electric or diesel, eliminating the engine change. Option number two, electrify and separate passenger from freight in the existing right of way. The premise of this video is a cell of service which will require electrification. The way to gain more speed with the same geometry is a tilting Acela train and separation from freight. Anyway, let's start in DC and work our way south. The first street tunnels that run south under Washington Union Station have low vertical clearance, but no worse than that of the North River tunnels under the Hudson River between New York City and New Jersey. However, some current rolling stock might not make it under the wires and would need to be abandoned as a trade-off. The route merges with the CSX, Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac subdivision, and VPRA is planning to add a track there. Hypothetical electrification may be limited to one track, but it's only a mile. The Long Bridge project is currently underway. This will add a dedicated two-track passenger rail bridge over the Potomac. Throw up some wires there and we're covered. The VPRA is also in the process of adding a third track in various places and separating from freight. 
like with the Franconia Springfield Bypass, which will allow passenger trains to fly over freight without interaction. Geometry through Alexandria will constrain things to 60 miles per hour. After that, half mile radius curves are pretty consistent to Fredericksburg, 46 miles south. This translates to 90 miles per hour with the exception of this 2100 foot curve, nine miles north of the Fredericksburg station, which would require a train to slow to about 75 miles per hour for a few miles. CSX also wants a 90 mile per hour cap, but I'm going to ignore it because that would severely handicap our fastest number four option. 90 miles per hour continues for another 18 miles until reaching a straighter part south of Fredericksburg. I have that at 110 miles per hour for 15 miles. We're not sealing and grade separating, so our Federal Railroad Administration limit would be 110. After that, it would be back to 90 miles per hour for another 18 miles until reaching Ashland, Virginia, where the tracks run directly through the middle of town with seven at-grade crossings in two miles. The right-of-way is also constrained by roads on either side, protected by nothing more than a curb. Open Railway has the speed limit as 35 miles per hour through here, so we'll go with that. Overcoming that sounds unlikely locally. South of there, those problems clear up, so it's back to 90 miles per hour for 11 miles until encountering a CSX yard that will make avoiding freight track interaction unlikely. Under 80 miles per hour through here, slowing further through a series of curves into the Richmond Main Street station, which someone felt was so uninteresting, they put a freeway three feet away from it. I'm not anti-car by any means, but when we talk about a time in this country when engineers were car obsessed, here's the sad evidence. Let's talk time and cost on this option. I have the 116 mile trip taking one hour, 25 minutes for an average of 81 miles per hour. That is a one hour, 15 minute improvement and certainly makes the trip more competitive with driving time wise. Including the 20 minutes gained from not switching locomotives, that would knock a trip to New York City down from 7 hours on NEC Regional to 4 hours 15 minutes with Acela. Before giving you the cost, let's quickly review how the cost algorithm works and the results that forward it as spitting out reasonably quick and dirty ballpark figures. All that said, I have this upgrade at... 8.9 billion dollars. A small amount of that would be alleviated by projects already planned and underway. The VPRA's longer term aspirations could be similar to option two, but capped at 90 miles per hour and without electrification. That would render a pure express time of one hour 40 minutes at an average of 70 miles per hour. That would cost about 2.2 billion dollars less. However, add another 20 minutes to put those five stops back into an NEC regional train. Like option number one, the engine change in DC would be eliminated by new dual mode locomotives. Now let's look at option number four, electrify and try to find a faster route through the region. Reasoning is the same as option number two and impacts are similar. That would keep us similar to option number two through Quantico, Virginia. Slow the first six miles, about 90 miles per hour for 32 miles after that. Most of that 38 miles is already grade separated. Normally I would try to do this by getting out of freight rights of way completely. However, the theory here is that Virginia Passenger Rail Authority would be amenable to the idea and frankly, Interstate 95 is not an option until south of Fredericksburg. Why? Because someone very smart decided it would be a great idea to consume the entire median of Interstate 95 with just two or three express lanes and an absurdly complex web of dedicated express on-ramps and off-ramps. As a result, they're fitting 10 or 11 12-foot wide traffic lanes 
into a 200 to 280 foot wide right of way and leaving no viable path for tracks while having up to 80 feet of median to spare. From Quantico, Virginia, we can eliminate four curves by connecting two sections five and a half miles apart. This will require a three quarter mile long tunnel through a hill, but will allow an Acela to, to get up to 160 miles per hour and stay there for about 45 miles. After rejoining the current right of way briefly, this new route would break off to the south for a new greenfield path. This would utilize modern engineering to cut straight through areas filled with hills and creeks while avoiding destruction of as many structures as possible. Here, after cutting through a hill with a short tunnel, the route would skirt the Crow's Nest Natural Area Preserve and cross Potomac Creek on a 75 foot high viaduct until reaching the next hill. This area would require a few tunnels around a quarter mile in length and also some cuts. It's difficult to tell from the satellite image, but the route would actually be below ground level a lot here to the benefit of local homeowners. It is not without victims, a handful of homes and farms would need to go. The route would then roughly parallel a creek called White Oak Run for three miles through a fairly affluent neighborhood, presenting obvious political difficulties. The route would then separate from White Oak Run and turn south onto a two mile long, roughly 25 foot high viaduct crossing State Route 3, the Rappahannock River and US 17 before entering the hills again. The route would continue through hills and around residential neighborhoods with earthworks handling the engineering challenges minus a 700 foot long viaduct needed to cross a narrow canyon. Here the route crosses the RF and P right of way, providing a potential loop for local access to Fredericksburg, which this greenfield route would bypass. The route would then parallel a power transmission line for four miles, crossing over the Mattapani River on a half mile long viaduct. The tracks would meet a 100 foot high hill that I would make a cut into to cross under four area roads and Interstate 95 northbound lanes. Despite sounding somewhat treacherous, grades could stay below 1.5% along the entire greenfield path. The collateral damage is seven or eight homes and farms, with many more properties crossed and impacted. The route would then enter a curve to the south in a trench around 30 feet deep and rise to the surface once in the Interstate 95 median, 15 miles south of where the Interstate 95 express lanes terminate. The interstate median is mostly accommodating here with geometry that would support 125 mile per hour travel for the 10 miles. That can be amended to 160 miles per hour by circumventing the Ladysmith safety rest area and a subsequent 125 mile per hour curve. This would come at the cost of one or two homes. At Rogers Creek Boulevard, this hypothetical route would jump out of the interstate right of way and hook back up with the RF and P right of way as it curves under Interstate 95 from the east. The transition can stay at 160 miles per hour. This curve near the King's Dominion Amusement Park can be adjusted to just barely accommodate 160 mile per hour travel without affecting local structures and that would allow another 11 miles of top speed for a total of 47 without affecting the CSX tracks. We established that anything but a crawl through Ashland, Virginia is unlikely, so I have a three and a half mile tunnel under the town. At that point, the Richmond suburbs are upon us and will slow to 125 miles per hour for nine miles until reaching the next obstacle, the CSX yard. It may be possible to squeeze around the yard on the surface, but I think a mile long trench would be easier. Worst case scenario, you'd need to put a roof on it. This would require some accommodation from CSX, but it doesn't seem too unreasonable or disruptive. The trench would terminate four miles from the Richmond station and we need to start slowing anyway. So we'll go with the existing slower alignment 
and some more trenching to deal with grade separations. If a portion of the train shed of the Main Street Station is available, we can use that. Another possibility would be to come in under the existing structure. If not, there is adjacent parking lot land available for a new station structure. If through running is considered, staying below grade may be preferable for crossing the James River and avoiding impediments between. Although from the look of the falls, that wouldn't be an easy road to hoe. Speaking of continuing to the south, Virginia and North Carolina are currently working on the R to R project, which would upgrade the mostly abandoned CSX S line to a 110 mile per hour standard between Petersburg, Virginia and Raleigh, North Carolina to provide a speedy passenger connection between Richmond and Raleigh. I will cover that further in an upcoming video about the Southeast High Speed Rail Corridor. Anyway, we've made it to Richmond. Let's check travel time and cost on this fancier option. For this slightly shorter 109 mile route, I have a time of 55 minutes, which works out to an average of 119 miles per hour. That would cut a Richmond to New York City trip from seven hours to four and eventually three once NEC improvements between DC and New York City are implemented. I have this partial Greenfield, Washington, D.C. to Richmond route costing $16 billion even. So what do you think of each route? Which one is your favorite? Let me know in the comments. Big thanks to the Lucid Group Discord channel for helping me out by coming up with this topic. If you'd like to join our Motley crew and enjoy privileges like weighing in on future topics, check out the invite in the description. Plenty more video ideas in the pipeline, including your favorite channel series. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big beautiful freeway.